Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is Wari Kintanya from uh, and Abby from uh, the Synergy Talks. And uh, today we're talking about some amazing stuff. Uh, and I think you're going to enjoy it. It's like um, I saw this post on, on Tanya's tribe, right? On, a, on the tribe that she runs, the self, self sustainable homesteading and gardening group. It's amazing. You've got to pop in there. And um, she posted about this awesome mozzarella cheese that she made. She, made from home at home and uh, i was like that is absolutely amazing and uh, so as soon as i saw that and i thought wow man i'm sure i'd love to make that if i had goats and cattle and whatever by the way did you what did you make it out of tanya what did you make it from raw cow's milk was it cow's milk okay cool yes yes listen don't you want to let your ring in i'm trying she's she's she's, she's wanting to join yeah it's weird i've 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 tried to add admit all and um just keep saying go, joining there she is oh yeah she's in now great there was another guy andrew who seems to have just disappeared now he's also yeah. oh there he just I popped in see. okay cool welcome guys um hi andrew hi lorraine hi hi guys yeah welcome welcome um oh it looks like lorraine's gone again i don't know what's going on but uh <laughs> anyway so just saying, yo, uh, welcome guys. Today is Friday. Can you believe it? I mean, it's like my daughter was telling me yesterday, it's 70 days until Christmas. Wow. So on that note, I was saying just, just before you guys joined us that uh, I saw the, this awesome post of Tanya making mozzarella cheese at home. Like, who doesn't want to do that? And uh, she made it with cow's milk from her own cows, which is cool. Yes. And uh, so when she posted this on her tribe group, uh self-sustainable homesteading and gardening i was like yeah this has got to be something we talk about right yes we talk about that on self-sufficient self homesteading and gardening <laughs> gotcha. self-sufficient yeah there we and, go um, and so yeah uh i was like we got to talk about this and then what can what pairs with cheese i was like instantly i was i was i was like it's honey meat it's honey wine wine and cheese everybody loves their wine and cheese right and a bit of a side a bit of biscuit and a bit of uh yeah, some nice little fruit and, and some grapes and stuff like that. So I thought, okay, this is the talk. This is what we're going to do. And here we are. So welcome to you guys. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we, yeah, pretty much do about a 45-minute talk. And then you guys can ask us some questions. You're welcome to uh, ask us questions as we go along when we open the floor for that. And so I'd like to welcome Tanya again and Abby, her daughter, uh, with us this morning. And let's fire away. Go for it. Uh, Tanya, tell us about this. You know what? When I saw that picture, I was like, this is from a magazine. Is it real? Is it real, Tanya? <laughs> Abby, wow. have you had this cheese? Talk to us. Was it nice? Yes. It's for real, hey? <laughs> well, how did you okay. have it? How did you have the cheese? I like this bread and then put it in the oven. It smells mm. like. <laughs> what, what else do you have pizza? Put on top of it? Do you have pizza on the fire as well with mozzarella? And yes. Yes. So no way. We, we have what we call a pizza braai, and it oh. sounds funny, but it's really delicious. Yeah. Um, and it happens so fast. It sounds like it's going to take really long, but it does not. Um, we make like a pizza dough and we have everything ready because if you don't have everything ready, your pizza burns. So you've, you, wow. you've got it on the coals and um, you put the pizza base. It's beautiful, Abby. You, you put the pizza base on the, on the grill, on the fire. Right. And it takes probably about three or four minutes it's cooked on the one side then you turn it around and you have to have hot That's pizza quick. sauce like tomato sauce uh, ready to scoop over and your ingredients must already be in your in your plate so you start with your cheese you add your cheese and then you add your other ingredients on top of that and it's about another four minutes maximum five and your pizza is cooked and it's a lovely um smoky pizza from the fire and it's got this most delicious cheese that we made um, on top the mozzarella that's just melting away and so delicious so oh. um how did it happen that we started making cheese well i need to tell all of you that i'm not a cheese maker i'm a homesteader and um a self-sufficient one at that so we try and do everything ourselves so 
And when, Lit oh, well, she is little. Little Lulu is the cow's name. She's giving so much milk. I cannot keep up. Mommy needs that. You can't go away. Um, I'm not going away. Um, she, she's giving so much milk. And um, I didn't know what to do with the milk anymore. And, right. You know, I was, I was uh, uh, putting it out to sour even for the chickens. So, that, so somebody would just use this milk. And I'm like, why not make cheese? <laughs> so... Got, got a recipe for the cheese and started making it. And it's so easy. Um, one thing is that cheese making has to be hard. And I'm sure there's cheeses that are really hard to make, but mozzarella is not one of them. So I don't know if any of you, Anya, Lorraine, Andrew, Bonnie, or Leanne, if ever any of you have ever made some cheese or mozzarella. Um, and uh, you can share with us just now as well. But I can share the whole method with you. Warwick, do you want me to go ahead now, or you um, with a, with with how I do it? Uh, yeah, I think that's okay. awesome. That's that would be uh, that's what we want to hear. I think. Okay, I don't right. have a goat and I don't have a cow, but um, <laughs> I'm at you least I've one. got bees, so I can make the you wine. Can, that's you awesome. Bees. You bring the cheese, I'll bring the the honey wine, and then we're good to go. Yes, yes. And we, and we can make like a pizza with that because the honey. Honey itself makes a nice drizzling effect, glazing effect of the pizza too. Oh, you see. And then a little bit of saping of honey wine. Mm -hmm. Lovely. All right. So go for it. Very yeah. much so. Right. So basically, if you guys want to write this down, you need um, four and a half liters of full cream raw milk. Um, I use unpasteurized all the time. So this is what you need, plus one and a half teaspoons of citric acid. Um, mixed to one cup of lukewarm water and you need a quarter teaspoon of rene plus a quarter cup of lukewarm water so the rene you mix with it's called a cup of lukewarm water and the citric acid you mix with your one cup of lukewarm water and you keep, set it aside um, mm. so you put the raw milk on in, in your pot on the stove and you heat it up to 32.2 degrees celsius okay, so um, you've got to have so a or thermometer yes. or whatever. That's, you need. that's 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 about just about the only other thing I think you need. <laughs> uh, you need a strainer too. Yeah. So so yeah. but but thirty two point two is not very warm. It's actually quite. Uh, it feels pretty cold, but it's it's thirty two. It's above room temperature. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when it reaches thirty two point two degrees Celsius, you remove it from the heat, and then you add your. I didn't say sorry. You cook, you, you, you put it on the stove, you add the citric acid solution, and then you heat it up to 32.2. Apologies for that. So that just goes up to that temperature. When it's reached 32.2 degrees, you take it off, and then you add the Rene solution. And you just stir it gently for about 30 seconds so the Rene moves through really well. That's very important, so it mixes well. And then you cover it and you let it stand for five minutes. Now, after five minutes, you, you open it up, the lid, and um, you can take a knife and you do like a curd test because you'll see that the milk has gone like gelatin. Um, okay. And, and if you press the, 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 the knife on the side of the pot and you just push it slightly away from the side, you'll see that it's like jelly. Uh, not as hard as jelly, but it's got that gelatin type of um, uh, consistency. If right. it hasn't got to that consistency yet, if it's still a bit crumbly, then you leave it for another five minutes till it's ready. So once the curd is ready, um, you, you cut it. You take a long knife and you cut in a crisscross pattern, uh, small squares, about a centimeter, I would say. Um, you cut, cut your squares. Um, okay. And then you heat up the milk until 40.5 40 degrees Celsius. When it's reached that temperature, you remove it from the heat and you right. let it stand for five to 10 minutes. You will see by this time, the whey has, um, thank you. By this time, the whey has um, separated from the curd. And uh, so you see the, 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 the yellowish whey with this lovely curd. You cannot scratch there now, my love. Thank you. Sorry about Abby. You need to sit still please all right so you 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 it's separated now now you take that's the other thing you need you see something to scoop with is I it? Use, <laughs> yeah yeah i wanted to just can i just ask you is renee the renee that you talk about is that like yeast 
Renee, Renee is what, what is uh, it comes from from a calf's stomach. Um, oh. and it sounds really, yeah. So it, remember when calves drink milk, they, they, their bodies uh, change it into a solid. Yeah. And that's what it does. It, it changes the milk of the mum into that curd that's solid into their stomach. So it's a food, it's more of a food yeah. base. We're kind of you doing it. like but biology. You do, <laughs> but you do like, get a vegetarian option as well, or a vegan option. You get Rene that is made from mushrooms, fungi. Mm. Um, oh, interesting heard. you should bring it up because I have a mushroom and garlic honey mead recipe I wanted to share today. Wow. So how's that? Wow. that? That's quite a cool. That's without us planning that. I don't know how that's yes. synchronicity, right? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so, so, yeah, it is a fun guy. <laughs> yes, you can use yeah. the vegan option or the Rene option, the fungi or the, 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 the dairy option. So then you take, I take a, um, a biggish size, probably about 15 centimeters um, uh, sieve. Is that the right word, a sieve? Sure, and then yeah. I start scooping up the, the whey into another bigger sieve. So the whey stop, I start scooping out the curd into the, the bigger sieve. And then the whey just starts dropping out. Um, or falling out at the bottom um and i slightly press it you have got there's another thing you need gloves <laughs> so i slightly press it with rubber gloves okay and so the way comes out completely and once the way is out i separate it into two or three balls because it's easier to work with if you've got it in two or three balls right um then a tablespoon of salt is added to your whey. So you can use um, those pink Himalayan salts or you can use normal table salt. Um, I prefer the Himalayan salt just because I like pink Himalayan salt and it's got all the added um, benefits. Yeah. So, yes, yes. Yeah. So I add one tablespoon of salt to the whey. Then I heat the whey again to 82 degrees Celsius and I take it off the heat. Then you take your three blobs of cheese or curd and you put it right. inside the whey. Now the, the cheese needs to reach an internal temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. So you can take a thermometer and put it uh, on the inside of your cheese to test. And okay. the moment it's at 60 degrees, you can start stretching. Now you don't have to stretch a lot. Uh, and this is where I am actually still um, experimenting because my first batch of cheese, I worked really hard and, and I put it back into the hot way and I worked it again and I put it back because it goes from a cl crumbly texture to it looks like melted cheese. So, um, but the first batch I overworked, so it was really dry. Um, okay. the, the hot way takes out all the fat from the, from the curd. And then you sit with a really dry cheese that doesn't want to melt. Um, mm. So the second batch, I didn't work it as much and it came out beautifully. The third batch, I worked even less and it was very juicy mozzarella. So, so nice. you, can, you can decide how you want to do it. Um, if you if you want a drier cheese or a or a moist more moist tree cheese um so it will just more in the hot water or less in the hot water so right. once you've got your right consistency that you've practiced and you want it um then you just shape it into the shape that you want and you put it in a bowl of room temperature way um if you don't have room temperature way you can just put it down on a on a on a wooden board and you can cover it because the first time you won't have whey because you haven't made cheese yet. So right. I just kept way back from my previous cheese makings and I put it in the whey for 10 minutes. Um, and You're then not I talking about way back into the future, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so -E yeah, then it, I think it's yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> so, so then it just dries off and you keep it in the fridge and you can grate it. It grates beautifully. Um, if you don't work it as much, then you rather cut it um, and you just put these blobs onto your pizza or onto your bread and you put it in the oven and it's super delicious. Mm. I think I've confused a lot of you with all the things On I've your said. your wine and cheese board. <laughs> there you go. Okay. And what so, I can do is I can post this recipe on self-sufficient homesteading and gardening. Then it's, uh, it, it's more organized. All right. Other thing I was going to maybe suggest is that we actually say to people that they, they, if they want it, they give, they, they can sign up for the recipe because I'm going to do the yeah. same with the meat. 
So okay. what we do then is we they, they the can that a free way. subscription or email. They send us the email address uh, and the name, and then they can get the recipes from us. Yeah, I think that'll yep. be cool. Cool Good. way to do it. Awesome. Yes. Um, all right. So with me, if I can uh, take, you know, be a bit of a Viking and kind of like, oh, it's my turn now. All right. Um, <laughs> um, quickly, yeah. So me to go with the awesome mozzarella that Tanya has been talking about making. Um, and I think uh, Lorraine was mentioning uh, the vegetarian Rene, which you then uh, talked about the mushrooms and the fungi, right? So being a more vegan option than uh, the Rene, uh, the, the original Rene or the only Rene really. Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Uh, with mead, well, it's been around for thousands of years. Honey, honey wine, also known as mead, drunk by the Vikings. And, uh, and, uh, and yeah, also by monks and many churches actually used to drink mead and offer mead, in fact, in the churches. Um, so there's a lot of back history about mead, goes back thousands of years, and it's probably the original drink, alcoholic drink, discovered by man uh, by fault, actually, where some water is gathered in, some, in a tree or a, a cavity where bees used to be, and because it just sat there and fermented, somebody thought, oh, this might be interesting to try out. And they ate it and they, they drank it. And the next minute, they had some happy times. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it doesn't take a lot, actually, to make mead. So um, different kinds of meads. Uh, you'll be, guys be interested to know, just like cheese, there's loads of different kinds of cheeses that you can actually make. And uh, the same thing goes with honey and uh turning it into liquid and what you can put in and infuse in your meats, okay, or your honey wines. So there are herbal ones, there's herbal, herbal, herbal ones and spice ones, there's vegetable ones, which are, is brand new to me. I never knew about vegetable ones, but it does make sense because you can put veggies in, you can put chilies and veggies into your uh, into traditional grape wines and or other liquids and, and drink those. Um, so that's pretty cool. So you can do almost any kind of veggie in a, in a, in a honey, honey mead, honey wine. Uh, you can also do flowers, which I've done this year. I've done some. I've done three different types of flowers this year, which is which is awesome. And then you can also do fruit. And uh, out of those come a mixture of different things. So you can get things like what this a sizer is what the fruit one is called. So that's C Y S E R. If you want to look these things up, there's a methaglin. The methaglin is the herbs and spices one, where basically it's got a more medicinal kind of uh, benefit as well to having alcohol. And uh, also warming and stuff like that during winter periods, and especially boosting immune systems like now when we when we have COVID and, and all sorts of, you know, all the other uh, illnesses that have come around uh, that um, tackle our immune systems. And then uh, the melamel is a berry-based uh, mead or honey wine. So you can take berries like elderberries, raspberries, strawberries, mix them all together, or make a singular independent one, individual one, I should say, uh, of either one of those. So um, that's just a brief overview of the different kinds of, of honey wines you can make. Um, oh, there's one more, which is the cooking mead. Now, the cooking mead is where you can take things like where they really have some strong vegetable-based type tastes. So that's going to be your garlic and your onions. And we spoke about garlic and onions uh, as an immune booster, making syrups and uh, tinctures a little while ago using sugar and honey water. Um, and kefir as well. Uh, so, but also you can now make a mead out of that. And then because it's quite strong and very fragrant, you don't necessarily want to drink it, but you can cook with it, which is pretty awesome. And so you'll have this mixture of having this, this it's kind of like thinking of having a scotch or a whiskey that's had garlic and onion infused for it for like three months. And it'll have that, uh, it won't be as strong, obviously, as whiskey, uh, uh, as whiskey or scotch. Uh, the alcohol levels around about uh, anywhere from, say, 7 to possibly 14%, depending on how you put what yeast you use and what else you're using, how many sugars you put in, how many extra sugars you can put in after your, your first batch. Um, so those are the different types of meats. And I want to give you guys a, a quick overview of the equipment you're going to need. All right, so if you can see this, this, uh, this, this bottle, this thing here is an airlock. Okay, so that's something that you need to have. And that basically keeps, you put mineral water or vodka, some kind of really strong alcohol in here, a little bit in, just in this, 
and this keeps all the baddies from getting into into your batch of of, of mead into your demijohn which is what this big boy is over here okay uh, otherwise known as a carboy and uh, this is a raspberry mead that we made earlier this year so that's still that's still busy um got a beautiful red coloring that's that's still busy sitting and it's still brewing on a second it's what we call a second racking so the first time the recipe with that one basically was a couple of raisins a special mead yeast and a bunch of honey and I'm not going to go into too many specifics but some honey some mineral water and then um, lots of raspberries and it came out this beautiful red color so we haven't tasted it yet because after a few weeks about six to eight weeks you, you remove ma majority of the, the old yeast or the dead yeast, which is called lees, sits at the bottom of the of the demijohn. There's still a little bit in the bottom of this one, for example. And then you also remove the berries and whatever else is floating at the top of the of the thing. And then you let it sit back. It's called racking. Let it sit. You rack it back onto the shelf, and uh, let it sit for as long as you like after that point in order to get it to the taste that you'd like and or the time frame that you'd like. So usually mead's not a very quick thing to do, although you can make quick meads. You know, I've got a recipe book here that's that you can probably make a champagne uh, mead recipe uh, over about six to eight weeks. But uh, traditionally, most of mine, I'm looking at keeping at least six to eight months uh, or longer in some cases. Um, Sounds like some of the cheeses. Some of the cheeses take months and years to make. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, That's some of those ones in those caves to... are like there for years, aren't they? So it... then up to four years, I've heard. So I, I suppose it can be longer. Yeah. So yeah, this thing protects the baddies from getting into your demijohn, but all the air and the, the excess, the waste basically from your yeast and the fermentation process will be able to bubble out of this. So what happens is if you overfill this demijohn over here, what can happen is that you actually have spillage. Yeah, it actually starts spewing out of the spewing the, the the energy from the fermentation starts pushing it out of the bottle and actually comes out of the top here, which is not a good thing to have, but it has happened. And the very first one that I did that happened to me. But um, this one is, uh, as you can see, an awesome elderflower mead, and all of these were pretty much um, all of these were harvested, wild harvested. So the uh, uh, the raspberries. Uh, actually, sorry, the raspberries weren't wild harvested, but the elderflower one was wild harvested or wild foraged. And we also got uh, some lacquer local honey that we used. So that was awesome. Yeah. So this one's starting to granulate a little bit at the bottom, which is what natural honey does to preserve itself. And this is how we bottle ours. So what are you going to need? You need you need to have the, uh, what do you call it, the airlock. You need a demijohn or a carboy. You can use a 20 liter bucket, but it must be virgin plastic bucket, okay? And you must be able to seal the lid airtight and then put in a put in the airlock stopper and uh, make sure that that stuff's all been cleaned. You need to use the, what do you call it? Um, uh, it's like the baby bottle uh, sanitizing powder. Um, it's a seriously strong powder that, that sanitizes everything. So you've got to sanitize everything. Uh, before you use it, the buckets, the demijohn, the pipes, the airlocks, whatever, even the pans or pots or whatever that you use in, to, in, in order to mix the water, the mineral water with the honey before you put it in the demijohn, that needs to be sanitized as well. Um, now, and then can I ask? bottles too. So you can see this one. I'll come back to you now, Tony, and say this one is, is a bottle we brewed last year, and that's what's left of it so far. Um, not not a hell of a lot gone, but uh, yeah, I'll be getting more into this bottle soon. Don't worry. And um, but yeah, beautiful color. You can see the difference in the colors. The one is quite a sort of orangey color. Uh, that's the elderflower. Now I've also made a homemade. Uh, I've made a dandelion and lilac, which is pretty cool. And that was that was all forage from my own garden. I picked up the dandelion. Most people mow them to death and kill them off. I waited for the dandelion to flower, and on an awesome, beautiful, sunny day, I went and picked all the beautiful little sun, sun looking flowers, which are the dandelions. Otherwise, also fed to tortoises if you have any, or if any tortoises live in your area, 
they love dandelion. So don't mow your lawn until after the tortoises and the dandelion meat is made. Okay, capish. <laughs> uh, so dandelion and lilac flowers, they went in my mead and the honey in the water and a couple of raisins and then the yeast and uh, along. I don't have that demijohn with me at, at this point in time, but that's got a beautiful yellow color. Um, and then I have made an elderberry flower one there uh, at, the, at, at the other uh, office as well. And that one's almost see-through, which is pretty cool. It's got a beautiful see-through color. So very strange, but awesome. Um, so what else do you need? Uh, you definitely have to have the yeast, obviously. And yeast is quite important because you can have a dry mead and you can have a, a what do you call it, a sweet mead. And depending on what kind of yeast you use, uh, which you can order online, um, they will make a difference, A, also to whether it tastes more like a champagne dry or sweet mead uh, in the making of your process. Uh, if you want to test the alcohol level of your, of your mead, you could use a hydrometer. I use a hydrometer. And uh, what happens is you measure the, you measure the, 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 the pre-fermentation stage and then post-fermentation post stage. And the difference in the level actually tells you more or less what your alcohol level is. So the, so the one that's in that bottle that I showed you guys now, that one is about 7%. I've got another one that's in, in the other office and that one was about 11%. So it does vary depending on what you're using and how much honey you're putting in. Um, but uh, you also need corks and or cappers and or bottles like I've shown you this one. You can use uh, the one with this airtight seals on it, uh, a bit more expensive, but yeah, they work out well. Um, and uh, you can also use something called a vinometer. That's the first I've ever heard of those, but I think that's more or less used in the wine industry or those so are hydrometers. And then the last thing you, you could use to choose to test alcohol on a very much more kind of exact measurement would be a refractometer. Now refractometers, we also sell at shop because we use them in honey. We use them to test the moisture content in honey, as, and, but you can also use them to test the alcohol level, which is pretty cool too. Um, so that in a nutshell is what you need to make meat. Um, how you make the meat is another thing altogether. I've given you guys some hints, um, but here's the cool thing, right? Is that you can make, make meat out of, like I said, herbs and spices, uh, vegetables, flowers, and what was the other one? What was the other one? Eh, eh, fruit. Yeah. So you can take fruit and berries and make it out of fruit and berries. Um, so I've done dandelion, elderberry, but here are some of the others. Wild violet, marigold, um, lavender. You can combine a bunch of these together as well, but obviously, depending on what kind of taste or flavor you want by the end of the day, you're going to have to decide what, what's going to work for you. What do you think might work if you haven't done it before? Hawthorn, hibiscus, roses, uh, rose petals, that is, and uh, gorse, gorse. Um, honeysuckle, and purple clover. And I think I mentioned lilac before as well, hey, the lilac flowers. You've got the pink, you've got the purple and the white. So those are just a few of, of the wild flowers that you can pick and, and use to put into uh, meads and, and make a, a lovely drink to share with friends and family. You can also, interestingly enough, make a beer, an ale, and a cider out of honey. Now, that's not something I've, I've had personal experience with, but you can use a hop and malt uh, uh, kind of yeast and recipe to make what's called a bragot. Uh, according to the Vikings, it's brago, bragot. Uh, you can make a herbal sorghum, which I think South Africa has got a bit of a history uh, of, of making sorghums, maize sorghums before. Uh, so you can make a honey sorghum as well. And then you can also make an ale. So... Um, uh, and then you can make something called uh, a grog, which is pretty much a combination of like a bunch of these things. Put them all together and see what happens and, and hopefully wake up the morning after uh, <laughs> with, with the use of your legs. Okay. Um, so yeah, pretty much uh, that is, that's mead in a nutshell. Um, not going into a terrible amount of detail, except that I'd like to give you guys one recipe while we're online, which is this one I mentioned quickly early on, Tanya with your mushrooms. Are you growing mushrooms? Are you growing mushrooms yet? I, I don't eat them. So. I don't know. <laughs> what? Okay, but I know a couple of your, I know a couple of your peeps, your tribe are, are, 
growing and they're so growing mushrooms, and definitely. Eating lots of mushrooms and all that sort of stuff. So that's pretty cool. Yes. So here's a here's a quick recipe. Okay, this is the mushroom garlic mead man, as it's called. And it is one to two kilograms of honey. This is about a this is gonna make you one gallon or four or four liters. Okay, for those who are non SA. So four liters, you use one to two kilos of honey, preferably honey that you get from an actual beekeeper. Okay, and also remember you get different kinds of, of honey. So you can get like, uh, you know, you can get blue gum, lychee, um, sunflower, and all of that's also obviously gonna make a difference in the taste at the end, a slight difference. Uh, you need four liters of water, uh, and then the yeast of your choice. Okay, so um, I use, one that's available on Amazon. So I don't know if you guys would be able to get that, uh, but you probably look at getting ones off, uh, what do you want to take a lot, right? Um, then you need uh, eight, eight heads of garlic and then uh, two cups of chopped oyster or shiitake mushrooms or one cup of broth or tea of the same thing. Okay, so 475 milliliters to be more exact of chopped oyster or shiitake mushrooms, 10 to 12 mushrooms, and then you put it all together and then put it in a pot and heat it up to about uh, 40 degrees so that at least the honey and the water mix together. All right, and then you've got to get the juices and the uh, essence out of the, bit out of the garlic especially, and, and if, especially if your mushrooms are dried, dried mushrooms, you're going to have to water them or, or uh, what do you call it, moisturize them a bit, let them sit in some water for a while. And then uh, add the mushroom broth at any time and then leave it in your demijohn or at least the eight weeks. And that's pretty much how you're going to make a mushroom and garlic mead, which is more of a cooking mead than a, eating, than a drinking mead. But uh, I can imagine that that could be quite tasty if, you, if you're wanting to make uh, you know, scrambled eggs. Imagine putting a bit of... I don't know, it might be quite interesting to have that over your scrambled eggs or a stew or a poiki or even at the bra, you know, give it a bit of a taste over your, uh, uh, almost a flavor, your, your um, because, of the, because of the mead and the, the, the honey content in there, it's going to make it quite, quite uh, crispy and uh, what, do you call, what do you call glazed. glazed. Plus you can have the taste of the, of the mushroom and the honey to go with it, uh, mushroom and the garlic to go with that. Oh, I'm starting to celebrate right now. And then you've got a side of cheese, mozzarella cheese. Oh. I'm just imagining it. Sorry, I just had to take a second there because that's just, I'm like, I'm actually starting to, I need some. I need to have a bra this weekend. Let's do it. What do you reckon, Tanya? What's your next no. project My after next the, project. With, with cheese? What are you going to do with cheese? My next project will be Hoda. Um, mm. I, in English, it's called Goda, right? Goda, Gado, Goda. Goda, yeah. So that's that's the next one, but that one needs to mature a bit. It, it takes one to two months or so uh, for that cheese to mature. So I'm pretty impatient when it comes to that, <laughs> but I want to try that because I do still have a lot of milk every single day. So I can yeah. experiment with all these things, which is really great. Um, there's another cheese that I also make. Um, I don't know whom of you know of milk kefir. Um, it's like a probiotic that you mm. um, that you culture. There we go. That's the right word. Yeah. Culture. Um, and what I do is I culture my my milk kefir and I culture it to a point where it's also it looks like curd. It's nice and set. And then I put that curd through a cheesecloth and whatever obviously after taking out the 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 milk kefir as well but anyway um the milk kefir granules you get the granules that's that actually makes this whole culture process happen so you put it through a sieve to get the granules out and that curd you put through a um a cheesecloth and you let all the way drip out um i normally do it in the fridge depends on how tangy you like your cheese if you like your cheese ta tangy then you leave it outside to drip. If you don't like it too tangy, you put it in the fridge um, and then the whey drips off and the product that you have left in your cheesecloth um, is your cream cheese. It is so delicious. And then you can add like garlic chives and some mm -hmm. pepper dews and some um, onion powder or whatever you want to add to it to make it nice and savory. Uh, you can make it sweet as well. You can... Um, 
you can make a cheesecake from that if you really want to but i prefer the savory option and okay. when i make kefir cheese it it well it's like the mozzarella it doesn't last i made um 10 liters of it's more than two gallons of of uh, Hoda, uh um, mozzarella, mozzarella cheese. Yeah um equivalent or not equivalent i use 10 liters so that cheese is is done it's finished i made it yesterday morning <laughs> so if i make what do you mean it's done it's like ready to eat or it's been eaten already it's been eaten so Whoa. yes okay <laughs> i mean i know nice. it looked fantastic but i didn't know it would go that quick wow but remember from from 10 liters or two gallons you yeah. get a block of get? cheese about this about 700 grams Maybe, of cheese oh uh, okay so about a so, about a bread loaves worth of, of cheese out of that okay you know, a medium sized and yeah. uh, it's just so good that it does not last i mean if if the kids are not making their own little toasties in the oven uh, they well abby's just lit a fire she wants to <laughs> she's fire. like i'm having that pizza again man <laughs> yes yes it's and while we're talking about abby apologies that she was she was a bit disruptive just now when i was trying to give my recipe and uh yeah so i send her off so she's going to make some fire all right but that's anyway. awesome it's <laughs> nice, nice friday so, afternoon uh activity that's cool man nice meal, yes, meal time very much so. Yes. so yeah we um in, in in for me as well the the cool thing about the vikings right is that they they literally lived on me you know drinking water was actually dangerous that was my to question yeah. That's my next question. They didn't have a whatever those things. Airlocks. No. So you can actually do it open, open uh, fermenting. But obviously, you know, that, that um, just like I did in the wild, you can do wild fermenting. Uh, that's how it happened in the wild. Is that there was just fungi out there. Water got in, rainwater got in where the, where the honey was, where the bees were, and, and it created the first meat ever or the first honey wine ever. Wow. And um, and there might have been a bit of a couple of pieces of fruit in there too at the same time from the same tree. Who knows? But you can open you can open uh, ferment. Um, it just means that you need to make sure you don't have. Bug it needs to be a closed room, you know, a sealed room where there's not going to be flies and bugs and ants and whatnot, kind of getting moving around in there and being able to get access into it because it's going to smell nice to certain flies, especially the like the fruit flies and the wine fly, the wine flies and things like that. They will they will want to get in there. And then it ruins your whole batch. Okay. Yeah. You do need to be I'm aware sure of that. I'm sure the Vikings didn't mind, but we we mind. <laughs> hey, that's where grog probably came from. They were like, "Well, it doesn't taste like it should, but we'll drink it anyway." <laughs> you know. So we'll just throw in a bit of other wine or something else with it, and then drink it. So it's it's all good. But um, the cool thing is that they uh, they also used to play a game when they did what mead testing or mead mead tasting rather mead tasting sessions and mead circles, where different different uh viking towns and, and families or whatever used to get together and have like a little festival and uh like when we get together and have a braai or barbecue basically which is probably on a bit of a bigger scale uh they used to play this call this game this viking game called cub k-u-b-b -B, which is a lot like lawn chess you uh if you want to look it up you get like you can actually make people are making these own their own sets and stuff and it's all written in viking gaelic kind of writing and stuff like that and then you play it on the lawn it's it's uh seems like a pretty cool game but i'm not entirely sure how well you end up playing it after you've had like a keg of, of honey wine <laughs> but yeah I, I can imagine there's a few a few people get hit hit on the head with these things what because they're meant to be thrown around on the, on the on the grass moved around on the grass and stuff so um it's pretty interesting there's a hell of a cool culture around mead actually and it's growing just like you know just like uh self-sufficient you know homesteading kind of stuff topics are growing mead is one of those things that people can do at home and uh, if you're not keeping the bees yourself you can get access to honey pretty easily from a mate to or friend or buddy whatever who's got bees you know in your next door neighbor and uh, and then you share you know they share the honey with you you give them some of the mead back as a, as a barter type system and it's awesome and then you can also get your sh your, your cheese from tanya so why not that's it that's such a cool thing that you just said. We've got a great barter system going on here where I stay. And there's a, a I've got a German friend, Petra, and um, she came here yesterday and she brought me a sourdough loaf. Oh, God, just the most delicious bread. And she put pepperdew in there and a lot of herbs and garlics and everything. And 
she like traded she said ah here's a bread for you i want some of your cheese i saw it on facebook so here i am giving her some cheese and she's giving me a, a loaf so awesome. uh, guess what both of us had mozzarella and pepper and, loaf, and uh, awesome um, yeah yes all so i need all we need now is to get like you that. Some, yeah all we need now is for me to get you some of my, my honey wine <laughs> So you can have that to go with it. Need. <laughs> need to go with it. Yeah. So, there we go. So yes, bartering is really cool, and it and, it, and it's very like you say, meat is uh, becoming this whole. What did you call it? Um, but it's it's creating this vibe. So is self being self sufficient yeah. and self sustainable. It's it's something that's growing um, with people, and people want to make their own stuff. So yeah, we, we should just. And the cool thing is that, that it's not something you have to drink. Can, you know, it's not something yeah. you have to actually sit and drink from a glass. You could cook with it. It's also yeah. got a herb. It's just like we, we spoke in our, our uh, herbal remedies and um, immune boosting uh, episode. Like I think that was episode two or three or something. We, we spoke about how you can use alcohol as a tincture base, which is much stronger alcohols uh, like wine and or even higher, which is the vodka and the uh, whiskey can and you scotch. Stuff, but you can, can do you the get same. meat to that alcohol level that you can use it for a tincture or not really well in this case what you're going to do is you're actually going to ferment it in the honey honey wine in the process you're going to you're going to put it in the actual honey and wa mineral water mixture and let it basically let it ferment so you can put the herbs and spices in there or like i said the vegetables in there and then they, you let them sit with the yeast over okay. a period of six to eight months, a uh, six to eight weeks, sorry, to initially. And then okay, you but remove. Your alcohol... But your alcohol yeah. content is a lot lower. But but the interesting yeah. thing is, is that it still infuses into the, as part of that Absolutely. process, the, the yeast converts all of that stuff and all the goodness is drawn out into the, what is, what is the finished product, which is the mead. So you still what? benefit of having the, so, for example, with the cooking mead, we talked about that recipe I gave just now, which is the mushrooms and the garlic. You could do garlic and onion. You don't have to do mushrooms. But that's a beautiful, not only is that a cooking mead, uh, but it would also be medicinal. a phenomenal medicinal, yeah, it would be Absolutely. a phenomenal medicinal kind of um, honey drink, honey wine drink. Um, I actually and then think you could this take, is a great idea. You could take, so something that, that I'm going to be doing for, for the next winter, which is, I need to start really now, is... Um, is essentially doing those uh, a methaglin, which is the formal name of what a herbal and spice mead is. It's basically, a medicinal mead, if you if you like. It doesn't have to be medicinal; it could be for flavor. But I think a lot of people forget that something that that whatever spices or herbs you're using, it's not just for taste. You know, your body also uses them for the medicinal phyto phytotherapeutic uses. And pharmacological uses that are built into those same herbs and spices so lavender it tastes nice on a roast but guess what it's also got phenomenal immune boosting benefits for example and that's just one you know garlic is another one garlic tastes nice gives you a bit of bad breath but it is a phenomenal lung cleanser medicinally you know and it also anti antimicrobial so it's antiviral antibiotic as well whole cloves the same sort of story so Whenever we take the stuff, whenever we eat the stuff, it's doing that for our body. But whenever you take it in a tincture, or if you're going to put it in like honey mead, for, for example, now, if you did that and made a methaglin or a herbal and spice based honey wine or mead, uh, you're going to have this, you're going to have the taste and you're going to get the benefit of, uh, of the medicinal and phytotherapeutic uses from that ingredient, which is awesome. Right. You are actually flipping my whole mindset at this stage because when I make our tinctures, um, medicinal tinctures, I use vodka, which I buy from the store. In the That's first perfect. stage, it's really expensive. It is. Um, so I'm thinking, why not do the meat option? Because I've never seen wine that's gone off or, or, or meat that's gone off. No, meat so, doesn't go off. So, so in in essence then if i add all the herbs to this whole meat brewing process uh it will have all the good things as you've said all the yeah. medicinal properties um and it's something i can make myself right here so i'm yeah. being convinced to rather use this method than than going to buy a bottle of vodka at an astronomical price mm. so, look it takes about a liter or rather a kilogram of a kilogram to kilogram of and a half of of honey to go with about, give or take about 
four liters or so of water, mineral water, right? To make That's a one gallon. That's the price of vodka. <laughs> okay, yeah, but remember the <laughs> remember the, the honey is going to cost probably around uh, two hundred bucks for. Yeah, sure, me, sure, for, but have for you seen the price two, of vodka in South Africa? For a kilo and a half. Yeah, exactly. I was just giving you guys an example, you know. Yes. And then, uh, but what I was going to say is exactly that. You're getting one liter for maybe the price of of where here you're going to have four liters of the yeah, same thing. Yeah, it just thing. makes sense. This makes sense. It's, and so, I'll be making and for, some mead. <laughs> cool. And for, look, uh, it does cost money. Obviously, the carboys aren't exactly that cheap, but you can get the buckets. It's, buckets are cheap. I prefer the glass myself because it's glass. But, yeah. you know, it's when you need a bucket. As long as it's a virgin, it must be virgin plastic. You know, don't buy recycled plastic. Mm -hmm. Um, but surely, surely those those three liter containers will work. It's it's like a can fruit jars, three liter can fruit jars, and it's you can do the three liter. You just got to adjust the recipe, of course. Then, you know. Yes, and and, then, and you can and you can attach the airlock to that lid, so that should work because everybody on a, on a homestead has got three three uh, liter um, jars. Yeah, everybody has them. Yeah, you can use those. You can reuse those. You know those big chutney jars. I'm yes. just thinking they've got to be kind of. You know, ideally they should be airtight. That's the only thing. Yeah. They should okay. be airtight. So you just got to be a bit aware of of making okay. sure the lid is going to be one of those, uh, you know, those jarring lids. You know the, yes. you know what I'm talking yeah, about. That, you cook, the, I, you I cook know. this stuff yes. in the glass. I can't remember what that's yes. called now, but you know what I'm talking about. Canning, canning. Canning. Jars. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> canning jars. So it's got to be a canning lid or an airtight lid. That's the Although arguably, as I say, you asked me the question earlier on, you know, how did the oaks do it that were airtight before? And I know that there are there are guys that are doing that have been doing this for decades, you know, much longer than I've been doing. I've been doing for 18 months now. But there are guys that are do that do it open. You don't have to actually have an airtight. So mm. and they're using buckets to do it as well without lids. You know. Okay. But you just need to I think make sure you're attending to the to the stuff so that you don't have bugs and whatnot getting in there. There are other ways of doing it where you've got like cheesecloth where you can also use like a cheesecloth or a plastic server that we've got like at our shop. And then uh, that kind of keeps the, you still have contact of the, of the, uh, the yeast and the, the, the fermentation liquid in contact with the ingredients, even though they might not be submerged into the actual ingredients, at least they're still in contact. So anything does get in and they can't, they can get into the, the ingredients per se, the, the the dry ingredients they can get into, but they aren't actually able to get directly to the um, to the mead itself. Yeah. But um, okay, guys, can we let's open the floor to some questions? Anybody who's doing who's doing mead, who's doing cheese, uh, who's anything? Who anybody got to? questions? Who wants to? Yeah. Hit us. Hit us with your questions, and. Uh, I think we need to do, we need to hold like a, a mead and cheese tasting session. Yes, a synergy, a synergy get together. Tasting event. And we can, I'll organize the Viking Cub game as well. We can play some of that. <laughs> arr, arr. <laughs> and I'll, I'll be drinking out of one of these. <laughs> you know? No, just joking. But, um, I do, I do have a horn. <laughs> I've got a Viking horn. <laughs> Drink out of so that that that'll be my uh, that'll be my little bit for the day. Um, yeah, so awesome. Okay, welcome Ben. Yeah, uh, pity you're a bit late, man. But um, join us, general. Join us every Friday, guys. In closing, join us every Friday. We do these except for the last Friday of the month uh, when we do, you know business uh end of, end of month business stuff admin and whatever uh and we talk about these every these kind of topics every every week sometimes we have guest speakers and uh you can hear about it by especially by joining and subscribing to our newsletter so or not newsletter but our our, our announcement email you know so if you join on if you join that subscribe to that then you'll get notified every week of what we're talking about and uh, what the topic is and then sneak previews to the live recordings and replays and other recipes and stuff like that. Yeah. So, I see Nanke is asking a question. Yeah. She's saying, uh, or I'm not, uh, well, 
Nanka is asking. Um, yeah. To make, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if you've got a recipe that you can share with us on on that list that you're going to send us. I do. I'm just going to have a quick look now. There was. It's not something I'm. I'm. I'm not a particularly uh, beer kind of guy, but um, there's one now which is a pale malt. Okay, so here we go, Nanke. Uh, whoever else needs to write this down. Uh, one time shushan, six liters of water, uh, three kilograms of amber dry malt extract, one kilogram of pale dry malt extract, uh, 170 to 300 grams of sriracha ace hops. It's growing in my garden. <laughs> there we go. Sriracha ace hops, fantastic. So you could also make beer, Tanya. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, uh, Cascade and US Fuggle or Fuggle. I don't know what that is. That's probably some other kind of hops. Um, you can use a combination of two or three of these or any other hops you feel like experimenting with. Uh, this particular guy only uses Cascade, actually. Um, and Cascade is, an, is, a, is a nice one to add to the uh, Sriracha Ace. Okay. Then it's 4.5 to 6 kilograms of light to medium bodied honey such as wildflower or uh, multiflora, probably be a good one as well to try. And then this guy actually lists two packets of yeast, which is Lavlin, L-A-V-L-I-N, uh, I-C-V, that's Indigo Charlie Victor, Delta 47, and it's a wine yeast. Uh, so that's two packets of that, or two cups or 475 moles of balm, which is something that you'd need to make from, from an earlier mix of ingredients. So you might have to look that up. Um, two teaspoons of yeast nutrient and yeast energizer or the 10 to 12 raisins. And then uh, about 18 liters of water. So you need a huge container to do this kind of recipe, but I think you have a good idea. And then it's bring it to the boil uh, pretty much Keep stirring, add all of the goodies, and yeah, okay. There's a lot of stuff to cover. There's like three pages of stuff. Um, but yeah, you need to bring the, you need to add the, the, the honey, you need to add the malt, you need to bring it to the boil and then let it simmer, and then add all the other ingredients. And then when you're finished, uh, place the, yeast in there once it's only only once it's cooled down okay otherwise you're going to kill the yeast okay uh so that's going to be um about lower than 21 degrees celsius if at any time you're making mead and you're above 21 uh, degrees celsius you can add the yeast after the fact of putting the honey and the, and the water together you're going to kill the yeast and then you're, you're not going to get fermentation all right uh and then what else yeah, pretty much um, if you're doing open or closed fermentation, which is what we talked about earlier on, Tonya, uh, you can place on the fermenter lid in an airlock. If you open cheesecloth for a, for a, sorry, airlock for a closed one, cheesecloth for an open one, uh, and then set in a warm, dark corner, and you should see for active fermentation within 24 hours. Uh, once it ferments, give it three to five days for the fermentation to slow down, and then rack it i.e. separate the wet ingredients from the dry or were dry ingredients and then um, put it in another container with an airlock and wait two to three weeks and voila you clean up your bottles and you might even have a bit of a sparkling beer at this stage naturally through that process i've had um, the same thing happen with some of my mead actually the very initial stages of about four to six weeks you actually have a, a sparkling taste, a sparkling, like a little bit of a bubbly taste in your mouth. Pretty interesting. It goes away after a while if you don't drink it straight away. So um, that's pretty cool. And that will end up making a... Uh, oh, and then you need to prime the bottles as you would for a standard beer or sparkling mead. And his, this guy's standard primer for a 5-gallon or 20-liter batch is 180 mils of corn sugar or 120 mils of honey dissolved in two cups of water. Okay, and you can find the priming calculators online. And uh, yeah, looks that pretty cool. That sounds complicated. 
it does sound a little bit complicated, a little bit more complicated than the honey and, and need, I must be honest. But yeah, you could probably look it up. Uh, Braggots or is the Viking name for beer. Uh, and then obviously that's B-R-A-G-O-T. Uh, but it, it's only more complicated because there's more ingredients from the sound of it. I think the rest of the process is actually similar. You're basically going to heat, heat the stuff up to about 40 degrees, put in the honey, put in the water, let that boil, then let it simmer, then add the other goodies in there. And then, um, uh, and then let it sit for up to five, six days to ferment. And then another two to three weeks after that, and voila, you've got beer. Pretty much the same as probably making sorghum, except that instead of using corn sugar, you're going to use honey, honey and malt, dry malt. Cool, man. I hope that helps. Um, but yeah, today we weren't talking, we weren't really going to focus on beer, uh, Nanke, but uh, thanks for your question. Yeah? Hopefully it helps a little bit, giving you that, that, that recipe. Uh, anything else, guys, before we finish up? If you didn't get all of the session today, we will have it. If you belong, if you subscribe to our newsletter, okay, the homesteading, honey bee and homesteading synergy talks with self-sufficient homesteading gardening tribe leader, Tanya and me from Beware. Thanks for joining us today. If you are registered with us on the emails, then uh, we'll give you guys access to the recording, okay? And future course, future, future talks as well and recipes. So. Get on it, share, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Any more thanks questions? Thanks very much, guys. Really appreciate it. Go make some cheese. <laughs> yeah, and drink the honey wine with it too. Lovely. Any more questions, guys, before we close off? Ben, have you got a question? You're a bit late to the thing, so maybe you want to, uh, you'd want you like to get more details for recipes of honey wine, he says. Okay. Cool. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it, guys. Thanks that's for joining it. us. Really appreciate it. And we'll yeah. uh, let you know when the next talk will be. And um, we've got okay. a talk plan on our organic fertilizer soon. So if you are a keen gardener, be on the lookout for that talk. Yeah, it's good. And it's quite special stuff. It's not mm. your normal fertilizer. You no. don't want to miss this one. All right. Yeah. All right, guys, take it easy. Have a great weekend. And we'll see, you. You. we'll see you on the chat again next time. Ciao. Bye. Thanks, Tanya. Bye. Bye.